Hallelujah. Praise your God. Lord, we come to you expecting you to be who you are. You do great things. It's just like a definition of who you are. You do great things. Every single thing that you've ever done has been perfect and awesome and just. Every single thing. Hallelujah. Lord, praise you, God. Thank you so much. Even how you forgave us because of what Jesus did, you did that perfectly. It is right for us to be forgiven if we are in him. Hallelujah. And so, Lord, coming to you clean because of what you've done, we will worship you. We will lift our hands. We will lift our voices. And we will sing to you in this place. We give you glory and honor and worship you for everything that you are. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Amen. Amen. I stepped in the water, the river of life. Got filled with the Spirit. Now I'm satisfied. Now I get to tell you there's power to save. Cause I
like a river, peace like a river in my soul. I've got joy, I've got joy like a fountain, joy like a fountain, joy like a fountain in my generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb and all have gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the Lamb your name is the highest your name is the greatest your name stands above them all all thrones and dominions all powers and positions your name stands above them all and the angels cry Christ, holy, 
We have a new song today. Um, you might have heard it. It's called Abide. And I want to take just a moment. And um, when we're dead and gone, we're in heaven with him, we will be abiding with him uh, for eternity. All of our strength, everything that we are, will be in him um, without effort, right? We will not, we will not be tempted to fall away, to um, separate ourselves from him. And so we will be, in a way, gliding <laughs> along with him. But as we live in this life, it really is a choice, isn't it? That we abide in him. He's the source of all of our strength, everything that we need. And uh, when we find that we're at our wit's end and we wake up and we go, why do I feel disconnected from him? He will never leave us nor forsake us, but we do have a part to play, which is to go back to the foot of the cross, to continually go back and hands wide open just say, I need you for everything. I need you for this. I'm not seeing it. I'm not getting it. I need it to be your strength. I don't have it, right? We have to stay in that place. Even as we fight, even with a sword in our hand, proclaiming victory, we're still on our knees the whole time at the foot of the cross. And I really feel like that's what this song is about. And so let's, let's stand and learn this song together and worship the Lord.
I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find thy power and thine alone can change the leper's spots and melt the heart of stone. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. is the second in a series entitled Living Free from Offense. What is this? It's a trap, right. Last week we talked about Satan's trap. We said that Satan's trap is living in the bondage of unforgiveness. And we saw that 
When we live in unforgiveness, refusing to forgive those who have sinned against us and wronged us, we find ourselves bound. And the trap of Satan, of unforgiveness, is more debilitating than this vicious looking trap that you're looking at right here. And how is that trap deployed? The trap is triggered when we become offended. Just for us to have the context on which we will deliver this message, let's review the scripture in Luke 17, 1 through 5. And Jesus said to his disciples, it is inevitable, that means for all of you kids, that means it's going to happen, it is inevitable that offenses or temptations to sin will come. But woe to the person through whom they come. It would be more profitable for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should be a snare to one of these little ones. So watch yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and the seventh time he should come back to you and says, I repent, forgive him. And the apostle said to the Lord, which we all would agree when challenged with this impossibility for us to do. Lord, give us more faith. It is an exercise of faith to believe that a person can change. How many of you believe that God can change people? If not, we, we are all lost. It is the concept of change that gives us hope that we ourselves can be changed. Offense is the tool of the devil to bring people into captivity. And we said that that captivity, when we refuse to forgive someone, brings us into spiritual captivity. It also brings us into emotional captivity. That our, our emotions are all tangled up and, and bound up. It also brings us into captivity socially. We can't go to certain places. And especially in the holiday season when we, well, where are we going to go? We brace ourselves. Oh, no, I'm going to have to go there and face that person where I have not forgiven them. Well, it also, in the long run, as all sin does, brings death. The Bible says the wages of sin or the result of sin ine inevitably leads to death. And so even offense will cause you physically to be bound. Sobering thought. Fred Smith worked 34 years for the Butler Agency and Joe was the new hotshot trainee and he had his eye on Fred's position. And it didn't matter that what he wrote in that report to top management were all lies. It accomplished what Joe wanted. Fred was fired. Fred felt powerless as if the company had stolen his security, his livelihood. It had stolen his dignity. And he vowed that he would never forgive that guy, Joe, or the company for what that matters. No one can really force you or anyone to forgive. Actually, Fred held on to the fact that the company owed him. And the more that Fred thought about it, the more angry he became. His relationship started to suffer. At night, he couldn't even sleep. Sleep eluded him, and his health began to break down. The fact that Joe didn't seem to care or even have a second thought on the devastation that he had brought into Fred's life only made it worse. As true as it is to forgive is to live, 
When we do not forgive, in some way, we die step by step. My son said in Alaska, when I talked to him about this message, said, in some way, unforgiveness, holding resentment against someone else, is like drinking poison and expecting someone else to die. It is so much about our life. Now, the Apostle Paul understood that forgiveness was critical and crucial to the Christian life. And he said to the people in, in Corinth, in 2 Corinthians 2, 10 through 11, in speaking about forgiveness, if you forgive anyone, I also forgive him. He wasn't going to take secondhand offense. And what I have forgiven, if there's anything to forgive, and again, we ended up saying that sometimes the enemy throws into our mind things and events and twists as he narrates our life with the thoughts of the enemy, things that you see in our, our experience, and he twists it to the worst possible scenario. He is always darkening the, the environment you're in. Whereas God, who says that in 1 Corinthians 13, that love is patient, love is kind, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, that brings light and joy and covers a, love covers a multitude of sins. Where Satan is continually tapping on your shoulder, pointing out the worst possible motivation, the worst possible uh, situation, and saying, that's what they mean. He is, he's out to kill, steal, and destroy. And he's pretty good at it if you look around in society. So secondhand offense, which Paul is talking about, he says, if you've forgiven him, I'm forgiving him. If there's even something to forgive, because sometimes it's just your imagination. Sometimes it's real. I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake in order that Satan might not outwit us or outsmart us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. The plan, the most devastating approach and, and, and scheme of the enemy is to divide people by vain imagination and by offenses. Because the Bible says he wants, uh, God wants to bless us with unity. How good and how pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity. It's like the oil that goes on the head of Aaron as it goes down his beard to the skirts of his garments. There the Lord commands a blessing, even life forevermore. So when we walk in the light, we have life. But when we end up following the dictates and the, the uh, insinuations of the enemy, what did they really mean when they said hello to you? <laughs> You laugh, but I'm sorry. That's how bad and divisive humanity has become. You can't even give a compliment to someone at work without offending them. You look minus today. What about yesterday? What are you trying to say? Are you, are you attacking me? Is this sexual harassment? Excuse me. I'm sorry. You don't look at all. No, I don't mean that. Just be quiet. Let's continue. <laughs> when one is caught in Satan's trap, the only way to be free is for the individual who has been wronged to forgive. And I pray that today, as we all aspire to live in freedom, that we learn from God's word how to live in forgiveness. Forgive is the primary word woven into the fabric of Christianity. This word not only activates our spiritual life, it also maintains it. We came into relationship with God because he forgave us. But in order for us to have maintenance in our Christian life, we have to continually forgive. He says, I forgave you, and I want you to forgive others. He, as we saw last week, this, even though forgiveness is free, 
It is conditional. He says, if you forgive, you will be forgiven. But if you do not forgive, neither will the Father in heaven forgive you. That's a little bit scary, right? So this is not an optional component in Christianity. The actual word forgive comes from the 12th century Old English. And it's combining two words, for and given. It's ahead of time to give somebody something. Some of the, the meanings are is to give up resentment or a, a claim of requital. In other words, forgive an insult. Someone said something to you that was not pleasant. You forgive them ahead of time. Oh, I just give you, uh, you've been given a pass on that. I won't hold that against you. B, to grant relief from the payment of, in other words, if you, someone owes you money, how many people have ever had anyone owe you money and not paid it? Oh, man. The rest of you, I'm going to borrow money. No, no, no. <laughs> Most of us in life have had someone borrow money from them, and then somehow it slipped their mind. And it can grow into a big thing if you, if you keep a, a meticulous record. And if they don't give you everything, you know, you know. keep short accounts. It's better to give somebody something than to loan them if it's, if it's just a short term. The Lord has blessed us. The more you give, the more you receive. At least I've found that to be the case. Number two, to cease to feel resentment against an offender. That's one aspect that we're going to talk about today, of being offended. And the third one is pardon to forgive one's enemy, to actually release them and absolve them of their guilt. I want to attach a visual to the word forgive to help us remember today's message. How many of you would be willing to participate and talk? It's all at once. How many will help me in this today? All right? All right, and this is what it, I'm going to be talking about. When we're golfing, how many golf, right? If you're golfing, if you hear someone yell the word for, what do you do? Yeah, yeah duck. <laughs> for is the international word of warning in golf. It lets the golfer playing near you know that there's an errant ball that might be heading their way and they should need make sure to prepare to take cover. Well, the world is like a golf course. And we are surrounded by 7.6 billion players. And when I want you to think as you interact in this world where people are playing through and they play right through you and their balls are flying everywhere. The insults, the, the slights, the cutoffs in front of you, the opportunities to be offended with someone and sometimes injured. I want you to remember you're like living in a 7.6 billion People, golf course, and balls are flying everywhere. And I want you to think of the word four. Everyone put four fingers up. All right? And this is going to be your part in responsive throughout the service. So, when you find yourself in situations where someone might offend you, maybe you are hit by one of these errant balls you know, and I will tell you, it is inevitable. You will be hit by that large of a group of players playing through. Whenever you are hit by them, I want you to think of four and say, forgive and live. If you don't, you won't. So that's your part during the service. Whenever I go, you say, Whoa, this is going to be a, two, a, a question and answer, a response. When you are wronged, I want you to think. When you start to be offended, think. Okay, let's read a scripture verse. 
Matthew 18, 21 through 35. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? And Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And as he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Now, I will say that in looking up how much that was, they were using an extravagant amount in this illustration, so much so that it was unimaginable that anyone could imagine having that much money. In, um, it's actually been figured out to be $6.4 billion. That's a lot of money. I'll never see that. But as he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him, or $6.4 billion. Since he was not able to pay, what do you think? The master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had had to be sold to repay the debt. And the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. Yeah. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. Now that was the smaller figure, $4,000. It's like a used car, the kind I've mostly bought in my life. $4,000 is my budget usually. That's manageable even by people who have modest means, like me. So to the people of the day, they thought, yeah, that's a, that's a lot of money, you know. But this man, when he found a fellow servant who owed him 100 denarii, he grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. It was realistic he could pay him back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown in prison until he could pay the debt. And when the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. And when the master called the servant in, you wicked servant, he said, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. Brace yourselves, church. This is how my heavenly Father, Jesus said, will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Wow, that is a heavy, heavy message. We we're the one that owed the $4.5 billion. And we are the one who was forgiven. And I'm not saying that the one who forgave, who offended you, I am not saying that they don't technically owe you the $4,000. But when you look at the balance sheets and you look at who is guilty and who's indebted to who, that $4,000 is one debt you cannot afford to collect. Matthew eleven twenty five says, And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, that your Father in heaven may forgive your sins. Forgive and live if you don't do wrong. Colossians 3, 13 Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Forgive and live if you don't do wrong. Will you remember that? Is this, whenever an errant ball comes in, whenever an offense comes to you, I want this to come to the forefront of your mind and say, there is a path forward. It's obviously wrong to intentionally hurt or offend people. But it's also wrong to stay hurt and offended. 
and refusing to forgive. In this world, we do not have a choice whether we are offended or wrong, but we do have a choice how we will respond. Your quality of life is primarily determined not by what happens to you, but how you respond to it. God responds to our response. We are engaged in a relationship, and he has done the heavy lifting. He has given us the easy, easy part to respond as a husband initiates loving actions of, of blessings toward his wife, toward he, we are considered Christ's bride. And God, the great bridegroom, Jesus Christ, pours out his love when we were undeserving. And does it surprise you? Is it unreasonable? that the bride should respond to such an overture of love and grace and forgiveness. So there is a response that is expected from us as God has forgiven us. God responds to our response. If we choose to forgive, God pours out his grace to forgive. If we choose to stay offended, we are held in Satan's trap and God's grace is withheld until we forgive. Please, please forgive. God is all about relationships. He says, if you love me, love my children. I love, I have, my family's here visiting from, from all over and, and Thanksgiving and you have your families around and you know how it is, you get a little protective of your family and kids and grandkids and if you see someone else, you know, dissing them, Dad or mom gives up, no, don't you do it, that's my kid. God has that same maternal instinct because we got that from him. We protect our children and God protects and he is not okay with us holding unforgiveness toward our brothers and sisters. 1 John 4 verse 20, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God who he has not seen. It's in the hot soup of relationship, the interaction of bumping shoulders with those we share this planet with, that the sin of unforgiveness happens. We aren't concerned. We can actually deal with strangers who who diss us right you know but we do care about what our family thinks and those who are friends i was a hick how many know what a hick is i was hick i was a farm boy from iowa the land of pigs and corn it was awesome bib overalls white socks a shaved head and my my ears are sticking out like a chevy with its doors open <laughs> and I didn't even notice. What do you mean style? I got my suspenders on, and that's all that matters. Let's go out and play. I tell you what, I was a hick. I was quite naive, too. Uh, I did learn how to milk a cow and did it before I went to school in the morning. I grew up without TV in my younger days, and I was organic before it was fashionable to be organic. <laughs> Homegrown. And my brothers and I hunted and fished, and I was very, fun, and we trapped. I knew how to use these things. This was, these were my toys that I, out in, the, out in the fields, getting the varmints and woodchucks and things like that. And there was even a time where I raced ahead of my brother, and, and he was saying, no, 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 as I went and picked up the trap, and there was a skunk in it. <laughs> Okay, so my mom had some washing to do when I got home. It was done outside, and me in a bucket. I was very young. And as a young person, when I came to Grand, big city of western Michigan, Grand Rapids, to visit our family, my mom brought us little boys, our little 
little shaved head boys with our Chevy ears over to Lake Michigan, and we didn't have any swim trunks. But my mom said, no one knows you. Just take your clothes off and go in your underwear. It looks fine until you get wet. <laughs> we may not care what strangers think, but we do care what our friends think. And the loved ones, the ones we are most vulnerable to, have the most opportunity to hurt us. I half expect the world to misrepresent me, but it, it takes me off guard if my family and friends or do. I don't expect the trap of offense to be found in my home on Christmas or Thanksgiving or just any Saturday morning when people might come around. I don't expect it to be in church when I come in to praise the Lord and everyone's perfect on good behavior. I don't expect that. But the Bible says that we should not be unaware of the Satan's schemes because that trap that is laid for us to touch the trigger and be caught in unforgiveness is laid everywhere. You have as many opportunities to be offended as you do have relationships. David, King David knew this and he described it in Psalm 55, 12 through 14. And I know what this feels like. And many of you do as well. For it was not an enemy that reproached me. Then I could have borne it. Neither was it he that hated me that did raise himself against me. Then I would have hid myself from him. I could have avoided him. But it was you, a man, my equal, my guide, my acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together and we walked into the house of God in company. Do you hear David's heart? And some of you feel the pain a brother offended is harder to be won than a walled city and their offenses their contention as bars of steel when a brother or sister or husband does us wrong the hurt goes deep 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 and the only way to get out of that death spire is to it is important it is inevitable that it's going to happen. One of the primary reasons that people become offended is we have failed expectations to the degree that someone does not meet our expectations. To that degree, we become offended with him. I helped you. But I needed help. And you didn't help me. I'm not saying that to you. But these are some of the thoughts. I forgave you. And then you're not forgiving me. I don't understand this. It happens in relationships all the time. I assumed that you would, but you did this. Oh. I know from experience. In my early marriage, my wife had some expectations. She expected that I would pick up my socks. I would do many things uh, and she told me and I picked him up and it was all good she said oh there we fixed that and I remembered the next day maybe or maybe even two days I was figure I need a reward I gotta get a star for that two days in a row my mom couldn't get me to do that you know she gave up. She apologized to Barb when I married her. I did my best. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. <laughs> but the third day, when she saw the socks sitting there, what? Is he doing this to spite me? What's his motivation? When my wife married into the Bergsma family, she was easily offended. I guess the Berksmiths can be insensitive. I, I don't know. <laughs> no blind spots for me. It, we all got along just fine. 
We were raised in the sticks, and we carried them too. And we had pretty thick skin. We were also very transparent. You see, what you see, you get. We believed in freely sharing our thoughts and opinions. Each person or family has different thresholds of what they are willing to talk about and discuss. And these differences are a setup, a trap for misunderstanding and offense. Be aware that you're walking through a minefield of less than perfectly mature individuals. Of course, you're the perfectly mature one as you tromp around and step on everybody. But God help us. If we look into the word of God, it will reveal things about us. And if we don't get it from the word of God and our parents, you will get it from your spouse. Because they got a different set of eyes than you. And you need those eyes. Those eyes are important because they're God's tool to bring you to address the issue of your offending people and at the same time, at times, learning to overlook by love. Love covers a multitude of sins. Cover with love. You know, so all of us need adjustments as we march toward maturity. And I personally need to be tempered. I need to become more sensitive to others. And Barb has been working on that in the most gracious way by the way she modeled her life and by the way that she would give me kind words of, Calvin, did you know you just walked all over that person? <laughs> what? They said, Hi, you were in the middle of a conversation, you just walked away. That, some people, that's rude. But I was, don't they know that? That was rude. I would like to say I'm totally cured, but I'm not, and you know it. Forgive or I die. <laughs> That's what Kelvin needs to do. But some families that need to toughen up, some who would never, ever discuss a touchy or a difficult subject. Issues that need to be addressed, need to strengthen themselves and not be so sensitive so they can learn to communicate honestly. Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. We do not want to end up hiding the truth underneath the guise of our snowflakeness, right? We need to speak the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. <sighs> love is such an important aspect, and it's a requirement for us as Christians, or we will be the one that should have a, some pretty big necklace put around our neck and, cost, and told to what cliff to drop into because it would be more profitable. It is the plot and plan of God to put us in relationships in order for us to learn to live and love. But if we become offended, we cease to do both. We cease to live and we cease to love. Let us love enough to be able to get together. And in our getting together, let us cover with love. Don't be easily offended. Allow others to be truthful and honest with you as a friend. I had a, a friend, I'll just say his name, Arlen Vanoss. Uh, when I first met Arlen, he was single and I was. You know, and you guys that are single, uh, I know that you're just thinking about Jesus at church, but... But I did notice when new girls came in. Hi, I made sure it was very friendly. Hi, how you doing? Yeah. 
And am I the only one? No, no, let's be real. But, so Arlen was my same age, and he came into church, and, one, and, and I, this was one of the first time I met the guy. And he, he came around, and you know Arlen. <laughs> Hi. And I talked to him a few minutes, and I said, hey, Arlen, you got bad breath. And he goes, what? You got bad breath. Here, take it. Now, he told me later that he was offended with me at that. When you just meet some young eligible bachelor and you tell the other one he has bad breath. And until he realized, he thought, do you know what? He did me a favor. We have been fast friends ever since. He's with my buddies. I've grown up with Arlen. He decided that that was a friend. Proverbs 27, verse 6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. You want to surround yourself with people who will tell you the truth. Anyone have gum? Because I know I... This is the hard part. So how do you go beyond just saying you forgive someone and get to the place where you feel like you forgave them? Is that brutal? Is this where many of us are? We want, we've said that. I tried and failed for years. I had a situation where someone really took me at a vulnerable time in my life where I had, was a young, in my, a young guy just coming back and started a business and we had a thriving business. And when that business, I was debt free. But somehow somebody came into that business and they... We weaseled their way between me and my partner, and eventually I sold the business to him. And it wasn't a good deal, let's just say that. I was naive. I was, I started over again. Thank God, as an entrepreneur, you know, you need to start a few things and fail before you ever hit something that works good. And so I, now I look back and I go, that was God's plan. But the more important than learning how to fail and get back up and start a business was for me to start learning the most valuable lessons I could ever learn. And that's how to end up blessing and how to move from, the, from forgiving someone with your mouth to forgiving with your heart. The Bible requires us to forgive from our heart. And we challenge ourselves. We go, I have forgiven, but why do I keep on break, break, firming up whenever I am re-agitated or I'm forced to have to look at the, the culprit? Why? Do I forgive? I forgive you. I forgive you. I love the verse that says, when you forgive someone, you return good for evil. It's like heaping hot coals on her head. <laughs> hot coals, hot coals. <laughs> Till I recognize that the Bible speaks of hot coals as a purification. Take the coal from the, uh, from the altar and place it on my lips and purify my lips. It is a redemptive thing, not a condemnation. It's not the coals of hell. It's the coal of heaven that purifies and brings freedom and life. And for 10 years, I struggled and was unable to get past the mouth thing to the heart thing. And then the Lord gave me a revelation, a valuable lesson that I needed to learn. Je Jesus said that he gave an example to us as to what it required to forgive. And I will tell you, I didn't have it within me to forgive. I didn't have the power, but I was trying in my own to do it. My mother told me something uh, that, was, that stuck. She said, if you don't have the grace to forgive someone who comes to your door, send Jesus to the door. Walk to there and in Jesus' name say, God, flow through me.
In order for you to get to that point, it requires us to yield to God's Spirit and allow His love to flow through us. Jesus on the cross, as the nails were hurting His hands and wrists and His body torqued in pain, dying for the world as those that hung Him up there gawked around Him and had their bloody spear still in their hand and those mocking and the taunting those ones who hung him there said in Luke 23 verse 34 Jesus said father forgive them for they do not know what they are doing he he went to a place of saying I see a way where I can speak in their defense, they are blinded by hate. They are blinded by their sin. They can do nothing else. And Jesus, instead of going to the obvious, they know what they're doing. Fire from heaven on them and consume them. He said, Father, I forgive them. I act as their advocate. And I say, they don't know what they're doing. As if a lawyer who is for the prosecution goes over to the defense side and says, no, they are innocent of this charge. When we go from being their accuser to being their advocate, when we move from being prosecution to their defense, we start to understand and start to have God's heart, which is filled with love beyond measure, fall into our heart and we become changed and we move out of the unforgiveness and the blame and accusation we become like our father this is what it looks like in matthew 5 verse 44 jesus said but i say to you love your enemies does it sound like you're their advocate or their prosecution Bless those that curse you. Does that sound like a defense or a prosecution? Do good to them that hate you and pray for them. Lord, have mercy on them. Forgive them. Pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. If you do this, you will be like your Father in heaven. I know this is hard, but with God's help, you can do it. You can be free, but it will require you to exercise the faith of freedom. As we said in Acts 24, verse 16, I here do exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. It takes effort to stay free of offense, but it is the pathway so that later on in life, when I started blessing this individual instead of saying his name in a degrading way and pointing as if I was prosecution, I came to his aid. And later on, we became friends again, enough so that I could again help him in time of need. Forgiveness. Another time, I had a business that I put all kinds of money and a Christian brother, a large company. I was, the, our, our accounts became very, very far from being paid, let's say. And the person was using positive words in that large company, large national company. And they promised complete payment that they weren't going to do this. And eventually uh, the company folded and I got left hanging at a time in my life where I could not afford to. You know, usually offenses come at, at the place where you can't afford to, right? Because it is a trap. But in some ways, it's a trap for you to win. But, but this time, I went to the individual and forgave the debt and took them out to dinner and blessed them and paid for the ticket. And I said these words, if you, brothers and sisters, learn 
not to end up claiming the prosperity message and claim I, all my bills are paid in Jesus' name when they weren't and all my needs are supplied when they weren't because of a bad business plan. I said, if you have learned that lesson and are going to speak the truth in love, then my paying thousands, tens of thousands of dollars into your event, investing in you, would be worth it. And so every once in a while, I have a sample of a bottle of shampoo that was the only thing I got out of the deal. And when I feel really rich, I go and pour myself a thousand dollar shampoo in the tub and rinse that down the drain because I keep no record of accounts because I am rich because God has set me free. I cannot afford to hold anyone in unforgiveness. Once you have forgiven someone, what do you do if the memories of the hurt linger on? You use the same tools that Jesus used to overcome temptation, and that's what it is. In Matthew 4, 4, the word of God says, and Jesus answered, it is written. We go to the word of God and we rehearse it. Remind yourself that you have forgiven. Say it on your lips and move to blessing. Move to the defense. Every time you think about them, say, Lord, bless them. Would you bring life and freedom? Would you set them free? Would you, Lord, I love them in Jesus' name. Set them free. I pour blessing on them in Jesus' name. <laughs> remind yourself that you did that, and then remind the devil. Oh, by the way, you lose, devil. You have no right. I have, I'm free from your trap. And then you need to, if it still comes back, Meditate on Matthew 18, 31 through 35, the story of how much you owe. And then look at the balance sheet and go, can I afford to not forgive? If you do this, the scripture will prove true. That says in Psalm 119, verse 165, great peace have they that love thy law and nothing shall offend them. You can be free. Forgive and live. Forgive and live. If you don't, you won't. I hope you've enjoyed this. To hear other messages by Calvin Berksma, go to facebook.com forward slash GCF Church or youtube.com forward slash GCF Church. You may also follow Georgetown Christian Fellowship with our app. Go to either iOS or the Play Store for Android and search for Word Server. That's one word, Word Server. And install the free application. There you will get all of our messages, including streaming capability.